Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to have you on this very, very hot, um, hot afternoon. Uh, my name is Laura Sands, and I'm chair and founder of the Food Foundation. And um, every year we have a sort of state of the nation's food system, the broken plate. And this heralds in some ways a, a sort of check, a health check on where our food system is today. Um, we exist, the Food Foundation, to build evidence and campaign for change in the food system to deliver healthy, sustainable and affordable um, food for all. And as a result, we've looked at some very key metrics that um, our great team at the Food Foundation, but many other of our collaborators are going to discuss today. Um, just to start with uh, a little bit of housekeeping, please do use the chat box. It's really, really useful for us. Um, but speakers won't be taking questions as we try to pull this event into one hour. But there will be responses to your questions um, later on. If you're tweeting about the event, please use the hashtag uh, broken plate. I wanted to say a particular thank you to the Nuffield Foundation who funded this report for the second year running and also to thank Fusion 21 for their support in developing our affordability of a healthy diet metric, which is a really important uh, part of the work that we do. There are many other partners on this report. We've worked with eight different partners, partner organizations on different metrics from the report and want to thank them for their input. This report demonstrates just how challenging it remains for many people in this country to afford and access a healthy diet. Uh, my concern is that this is only the start of some increased problems due to inflation and the impacts that's having on families' incomes and families' ability to buy and access good food. But today we will have, as I say, some partners and um, some a, a fellow trustee. And I am absolutely delighted to introduce Sir Michael Marmot, who is a, a stalwart of the Food Foundation, who has been building huge amount of evidence throughout his academic career, but has really brought this to life and really brought this to the Food Foundation to give us rigor and evidence. Um, I think he needs very little increased uh, introduction as one of the leading lights in our field. So delighted that you can give us some reflections, Michael, on this report and what you see the challenges ahead. Thank you. Many years ago, I was in debate with the great Chicago economist, economic historian Robert Fogel, and looking at the US, but he might have been looking at the UK. He said, we've solved the problem of egalitarianism of material resources. The big challenge is now what he called spiritual uh, resource. And my comment was I've been out of California too long to think about egalitarianism of spiritual resources. But I knew what he meant. Um, we might use words like agency, uh, control, uh, self-development and the like. The problem is, in Britain, in the 21st century, that solving of the problem of material resources is now under threat. If people can't afford to eat, if people can't afford shelter, what could be more basic than that? In the fifth richest country on the planet, in the 21st century, we have inadequacy of the basic material resources. Sometimes people say, oh, come on, health keeps getting better all the time. What are you going on about? Well, there have been three recent threats to health. The first was the decade of austerity, and it was a real shock. Overall, life expectancy stopped improving, health inequalities increased, and life expectancy for the poorest people went down. The second big shock was the pandemic, and again, it exaggerated the inequalities in health. And the third big shock 
is the cost of living crisis. And each of those, austerity, the pandemic, and the cost of living crisis, increases inequalities. And inequalities are fairly basic resources. As you know, Laura, I quoted an earlier statistic from Broken Plate that the people in the bottom 10% of household income, they would have to spend 74% of their income on food. I've got to get up to date now with the latest Broken Plate report and people in the bottom quintile would spend 47%. And I had um, senior businessmen saying, oh, you just want to tell people what to do all the time. You're the representative of the nanny state. No, 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 I said. If people in the top 20% who only need to spend 11% of their income on healthy food, if they feed their children unhealthy food, they're being irresponsible. But if people in the bottom quintile feed their children unhealthy food, it is because, as your broken plate report demonstrates so clearly, healthy food is more expensive. They can't afford it. Uh, they're not being irresponsible, they're being poor. And they're being poor through no fault of their own. What the Food Foundation is doing and what the Broken Plate Report does is show that, I'll leave the third one out, others can talk about appeal, but these two key issues of affordability and availability are absolutely central to inequalities in health. I've just come from a Bernardo seminar where they're talking about children. We weren't at the Bernardo seminar talking about obesity, but we might have been. And the fact that the inequalities in obesity are present in children went up during the pandemic and will continue, the inequalities will continue to rise if healthy food is unaffordable. And that has two components, how much money people have to spend and the cost and availability of food. So we're back in very basic stuff. And I'm not a Maslow hierarchy of needs person. I think we need to deal with the basic resources and spiritual, psychosocial issues at the same time. Being unable to feed your children is a way of depriving people of agency. Being unable to feed your children is a way of depriving people of the opportunity to lead lives of dignity that they value. What Broken Plate does, and for another reason, I'm so pleased with what it does. The push that I've been making is that we need evidence that Policy based on good intentions or nice words is okay, but we need evidence. I'm so pleased that the current candidates to lead the Conservative Party are talking about inequalities in health and healthy food and availability and early child development. Uh, you notice I'm being ironic. Um, we need evidence and we need to present the evidence in a spirit of social justice. This is what Broken Plate does, and it's an absolutely central contribution to our public debate. So congratulations, and I'm pleased to welcome the report. Thank you so much, Michael. And your observations on what is actually a healthy life, what we actually deserve um, for ourselves and for our children should be absolutely key to the political debate and particularly in consideration of some of the findings of the bro this broken plate where we are heading in such a bad direction. It now gives me huge pleasure to introduce Anna Taylor who is our executive director and a leader of a great team so it's Anna is, is fabulous and, and really pushes us forward. 
but there's a huge team behind her that is absolutely essential to the broken plate. Um, you're going to discuss and in some ways demonstrate the real human costs of unhealthy food environment and the outcomes that we found this year. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, Laura. And um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to kick off by saying a very big well done to the team who've pulled together this year's report. Um, Shona, Isabel and Lois on the comms have all done a really fantastic job. Huge congratulations to you all. And my what I'm going to say really is a prelude to our collaborators who are going to talk about some of the individual metrics. And those of you that are familiar with the Broken Plate Report, we'll know that what we try to do with it is to, to present a set of metrics which tell us, tell a story about the environment in which we're making decisions about what we eat and that tell us to what extent that environment is actually helping us to eat well. And by eating well, I mean eat, eat in a manner which both protects our health and also protects um, the planet that we're, that we're living in. Um, and I think what our collaborators will demonstrate as we go through some of these individual metrics and look at them in some detail about how the whole environment is balanced in the wrong direction at the moment and creating the wrong set of incentives which make it really hard for us um, to eat well and to eat in a manner, eat a healthy and sustainable diet. Um, so. Uh, Michael mentioned um, the nanny state argument. Of course, there are uh, whatever you think really about the role of government in actually intervening and trying to shift some of these metrics. You might be of the view that that um, in some way takes away personal freedom. I think what we demonstrate here in the report is that this is in the first instance a question of balance because what we're keen to see is that healthy and sustainable um, options are um, given a fair chance, giving a fighting chance in the food environments in which we're operating and that we as customers, consumers, citizens are not having to do the real heavy lifting. But what I wanted to focus in on really was not so much the metrics themselves, we'll get into those, but really the cost of inaction, why the cost really matters and what it ma uh, what it means for us as citizens of the UK and what it means for our environment. Um, and what we do, you'll see in the, the list of metrics which are listed on the bottom of the screen there, is we look at a set of um, outcomes, health and environmental outcomes, um, which taught, which demonstrate the impact that these damaging food environments are having on our health. Um, we start with those that are related to children, children's weight and children's growth. Children are literally, children's bodies are actually physically bearing witness to the environments in which they're growing up. Children's height is different between the wealthiest children and the, uh, the poorest children. And we've seen childhood obesity rise, continue to rise and, and with major disparities between health, uh, uh, better off children and, and low income children. Um, there is a little bit of good news on that front, which I'm going to mention in a moment. Um, but overall, the picture for, for both of those indicators remains very bleak. Um, and the, co the COVID pandemic has, has certainly contributed to a significant worsening of the childhood obesity rates. Um, uh, the other outcomes that we look at are that I wanted to draw your attention to is the 23% increase in the uh, number of diabetes related amputations. Um, nearly 10,000 of those amputations are carried out on average every year now. Um, this number is rising. Um, and, and the staggering differences in healthy life expectancy between the most deprived tenth of the population and uh, the, the least deprived tenth. This amounts to between 18 and 20 years of life living well or living um, with uh, a chronic condition um, uh, that, that's affecting your, your health and well-being. So if we go back to those arguments around freedom, I would argue really that health is both an asset to us as an individual, it's, a, it's an asset to um, the communities in which we uh, take care for one another, 
And of course, as in public health terms, it's an asset to the economy. And in doing so, in being an asset, it brings a whole set of freedoms to us, um, which are stripped away if you're grappling with chronic disease. Our worlds get smaller. Um, and of course, there's the knock on effects um, that it has um, on the NHS. But I think it's true to say that public health still remains a, um, a low level topic for public policy priorities and um, just because it's topical I'm not intending to make a party political point here because it's this is not a, this issue doesn't cut across party bounds in that sense but there's just been a recent members survey of the, the conservative reform group and they were polled on policy priorities the 15 not, none of the 15 winning policy priorities were around health um, net zero came 10th on the list. So health, those health and environmental outcomes have got a very, very long way to go before they become top of the political priority, priority list. And I'll, I'll come back to that point in, in just a moment. There's a little bit of good news, and that's, as luck would have it, on the day that we published the Broken Plate Report, the government has just published its very latest uh, National Child Measurement Programme data. And so instantly our childhood obesity data in the report are out of date. Apologies for that, everybody. What's good about it is that um, we saw a huge spike uh, during the pandemic year and we've seen a slight um, improvement in the situation since last year. Um, that's obviously very good news for children. I think it's also good news when you look at that graph because you see how fast childhood obesity rates can change. And let's not forget that many of these outcomes that we're grappling with here are entirely preventable. And when you see the graph shift that quickly, it, it should be really empowering to policymakers to think we can really make a very big difference very quickly. We don't have to wait and see the results of our actions in decades to come, which is obviously often a drag on, political, uh, on the political process and the policymaking process. But we do need a strategic approach to tackling some of these challenges that is underpinned by a long term commitment. And we had a really major opportunity in the form of the National Food Strategy, which the government commissioned as an independent review and which was published last year. And I would argue a, a, an opportunity largely squandered, unfortunately, though we did in the food strategy paper have some important commitments which are there to build on and we must build on them. Um, we haven't yet set out as a nation an agenda for how we really want to reorient our food system to deliver a better set of outcomes for all of us and for our environment. Um, so uh, I think we have to um, uh, acknowledge we'll, we'll, we're anticipating some kind of political reset in the autumn and we should be treating this of course, is an opportunity. And what we do when we produce Broken Plate is that we, um, we try to present the evidence in a way which makes a case for change and which provides everybody with a compelling set of statistics. We're all, I'm sure many of us on this, on this webinar today are advocates and change makers in different ways. And we'd really encourage you to use the report, tell us how you're using the report, how we could make it even better and more useful, because it's, it's there for us all to be making a case for action so that next year we start to see some of those statistics move in a better direction. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Anna. And it is a, a massive call to action. And it is shocking that public health as a subject has in many ways for the last 20, 30 years uh, really fallen down the agenda. And this is an absolute seminal moment where we need to start to ramp it up. And as Anna says, I hope everybody on this call who's an activist, who are campaigners, who are policy makers can take this uh, message much, much more widely. And hopefully if working together, we can, we can make a compelling case. Um, we're now going to move on from, in some ways, Anna's overview and particularly those health and health outcomes um, to invite some of our great collaborators, our great partners who've been doing a huge amount of work on some of the other metrics. Um, I'm going to introduce Laura Chan from the Soil Association. 
she is going to talk about a new metric which has been introduced into this broken plates report in the quality of food in schools. Um, we've had a lot about school food, Marcus Rashford's campaign, but actually what we must ensure is that the impact of inflation, uh, the impact of, of cutting costs is not going to start, or well, it has already, but that we absolutely must start to raise the standards um, of food in schools. So Laura, over to you. Well, thanks, Laura, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak today at the launch of such an important and really timely report as well. So I'm Laura from the Soil Association, and at the Soil Association, I'm really happy that school food is included as one of the metrics in the report this year. As millions of children are eating meals in school for about 190 days per year, school food is a fundamental part of the food system, and it's crucial that this food is healthy, nutritional, and as sustainable as possible. School food is an integral part of the school day, which supports learning and development. It can support tackling inequalities and it provides opportunities to learn, for example, how to cook, how to grow, where food comes from. But for also for many, it provides a nutritional safety net, which is why at Food for Life, we're dedicated to making good food available for all and accessible to all, including for students in schools. So Food for Life is a Soil Association programme and Food for Life Served Here is a certification scheme with caterers cert certifying to bronze, silver and gold levels. For school caterers, meeting the school food standards is a baseline criteria and it's checked annually at inspection. In England, Food for Life Served Here is the only third party scheme that checks compliance with the school food standards. In Scotland, the annual inspection reinforces the work of the Scottish government, providing further verification that Scottish caterers are meeting the Scottish school food standards. As you can see from this slide and in the broken plate report, 25% um, of schools in England are certified food for life served here, which means that only 25% of schools in England are known to be meeting the school food standards. And this is predominantly in primary schools. Although the school food standards are mandatory, there are no means in England, apart from Food for Life Served Here, to check compliance. And this means that 75% of schools in England, we don't know what the quality of the school food is like, as Laura alluded to. I'd love to think that the school food is all fantastic, but we know that through our previous reports at Food for Life, um, alongside the work of other organisations such as Bite Back, that particularly in secondary schools, food isn't always up to scratch and it's not quite meeting the standards that we'd like to see. And this is really jeopardizing the health and future of our next generations. At the Soil Association, we're really proud of our Food for Life served here caterers. Not only are they meeting the school food standards, ensuring that schools meet the nutritional recommendations in the standards, but they're also meeting our additional criteria such as procuring locally, seasonally, and more sustainably, including higher welfare. And for silver and gold, this also includes, includes spend on organic and leaf products as well. And all served here caterers are preparing fresh meals to ensure high nutritional quality within their meals. We know that the cost of living crisis is having a massive impact on school caterers at the moment. And we're hearing stories of caterers having to change menus um, and our served here caterers are working closely with our Food for Life teams to ensure that they're continuing to meet the school food standards and the served here criteria to ensure that all children across England and Scotland are served healthy and nutritious and sustainable meals. Um, going forwards, we'd really like to see more robust monitoring enforcement of the school food standards to make sure that all children have access to healthy meals across all four nations. Alongside this, we'd like to see a reform of school food system so it works for everybody. And that includes extension of eligibility of free school meals with an ambition to follow Scotland and Wales in a universal approach so that every child has access to at least one healthy meal a day. And we'd like to see more ambition in the government buying standards change, which is coming up soon. Um, and that should be mandated across public sector to make sure that the meals are also sustainable as well. Um, and so this is why we think we're really happy to be included in the Broken Plate Report this year and tracking school food 
the, in this report is a real way to show progress um, in school food and improving nutrition for our next generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And it is absolutely essential that we have visibility of, of school food and that we actually start to, to as, you've, as you're doing, accredit it. But I do think that we have got to truly understand that this sometimes is the only proper meal that some children are getting. And the idea that we are sort of giving them absolutely suboptimal food or with inflation, sort of salami slicing the quality is a, is a real, real problem. So thank you, Laura. Um, next up, you will hear from Tom Bergemann from the University of Cambridge. Um, we at the Food Foundation partner with Tom and his colleagues on places to buy food on the high street. And this is a metric which we've used before, but have worked very closely uh, with Cambridge on this. This year, we find that one in four places to buy food are fast food outlets. And that in the poorest area, this is closer to one in three. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, Laura. Um, so, so as Laura said, uh, we at the MRC Epidemiology Unit have collaborated with the Food Foundation on this report and on the places to buy healthy food on the high street metric using data from abundance survey for the fourth year in a row now. And we're really privileged to be able to um, kind of demonstrate trends over time in this metric. So that's really what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. We know that when unhealthy food is the easy option, it results in unhealthy behaviours. And that's something that we've shown time and time again in our research. This metric tracks the proportion of all food outlets that are unhealthy fast food outlets. So currently, this time around, this stands at 26.2%. So 26% of all food outlets are fast food outlets. And that's up from 25% just four years ago, the first time we created this metric for the Food Foundation report. We know these recent changes over the last four years are just part of longer term trends uh, and year on year growth in the, in the proportion of all food outlets that are fast food and the total numbers of fast food on our high street in the long term. Um, if we delve down a little bit, we can see that this year alone, one in five local authorities have seen an increase of over 5% in that proportion of all outlets that are fast food. For many, fast food is the very easiest option. And of course, it's also very affordable and appealing, as um, we're hearing about today from the other speakers. This metric also brings right up to date our understanding of how unequal our surroundings are with respect to unhealthy food access. So those in the most deprived fifth of local authorities can expect nearly a third of their accessible food outlets to be offering them fast food. And therefore, I say it's no surprise that the burden of obesity and poor health in our society or diet related health, at least in our society, is felt unequally. And um, as Michael said, that's a social justice issue. Local authorities do indeed have all the powers they need to shape healthier food access on our high streets. Um, high streets are planned and they're, they're, they're no accident. Um, they can intervene, but their powers are mild. However, in the long term, we can achieve significant change. It just needs the, the will, the public will and the political will to do so. We don't have to accept that the trends we've observed in collaboration with the Food Foundation and indeed before that are somehow inevitable. It is, a how, it is however, important that we've been able to shed light on these trends in collaboration with the Food Foundation. And we hope to see some change in these metrics in the future. Thank you very much, Tom. And I mean, this makes it very, very important that we look at the food environment and those healthy neighborhoods, we need to create much healthier neighborhoods. And that, that needs to be done in many ways through local authorities and local communities, giving them more opportunity to design their neighborhoods. Um, I certainly have seen in my own experience where in very deprived areas, really every every other shop is uh, is a takeaway and i uh, picking up on anna's point about the nanny state this is the food that's accessible to those people who live in that neighborhood and we have to understand that that is in many ways sometimes the only options for those families so thank you tom now we're go going to move on to eleanor salazar from eating better to talk about the implications of the analysis they've done for the sustainability of convenience foods in high street settings, um, i.e. where food is accessible to the majority of the public. 
Um, this year, we find that 71% of sandwiches from high street retailers contain meat or fish, with no significant improvement in the number of vegetarian and plant-based options in the last three years. So, Elena, thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, for having me here. We have contributed to Broken Plate for the last couple of years, and we are really happy to be included in the report. At Eating Better, we run yearly surveys that look at the changes in the offer of pre-prepared foods, such as sandwiches and ready meals. We do this because we think that retailers have a really important role to play in creating the right food environments to help people make healthy and sustainable choices. And we understand that for many people in the UK, this means finding ways to eat more fruit, more vegetables, more beans and pulses and cutting down on meat and cheese. We understand as well that convenience is important. So what is available on the shelves will shape people's choices and the lack of a good variety of plant-based and vegetarian foods at affordable prices is going to be a huge obstacle for people looking to eat better for their health and the planet. What we look at is the proportion of products that are vegetarian and vegan um, with respect to the proportion of products that are meat-based or fish-based. This year, um, we looked at 430 sandwiches available at 14 UK high street retailers. This includes all of the main supermarkets as well as a number of food chains. We collected the data from retailer websites and also through in-store field work where that wasn't possible. And what we found was a bit dispiriting. The sandwich offer in the high street continues to be dominated by meat and cheese. 71% of sandwiches contain either meat or fish. There is no significant improvement in the past three years. We found meat was the main ingredient and it was part of 59% of the sandwiches we surveyed. Of those, 38% contain red or processed meat and 28% contain chicken. And it was particularly sad to see that following several years of tracking increases in plant-based and vegetarian products, this year we found that many supermarkets had significantly reduced their offer of both plant-based and vegetarian products. In particular, there were 21% less vegetarian products on sale. Um, and some of the stores we surveyed had actually removed all of their plant-based options in the stores we surveyed. We also found that on average, plant-based options were the most expensive sandwich type. We think retailers can do much better from the Eating Better Alliance. Uh, for us, this means that meat products would make less than 50% of the offer to give people more of a range and more of an option uh, to choose different sandwiches. Increasing the amount of healthier fillings, such as beans and vegetables in the available sandwiches, and really working to price those plant-based options more competitively against fish and meat options. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. And I think that you make the point again about the feedability. There's a lot of chat around what is a nanny state and what is freedom and picking up on Michael's point about freedom, affordability of good food or the lack of affordability of good food actually restricts freedom, not enables it. And that's absolutely crucial that we really pin this particular debate down. And your metrics are very, very interesting and important to look at both affordability and accessibility. So thank you. Um, the fourth metric we're, we're going to discuss, um, the Food Foundation looks at the whole system, and I think that's maybe one of our, our sort of unique approaches. And I'm absolutely thrilled to invite um, Will Nicholson, who is part of the Food Foundation, who leads up our Plating Up Progress report and project. Um, what he's going to look at, which I think is really, really important, is in some ways the accountability of food businesses and how they report on healthy and sustainable food sales. We're also working quite closely with investors to ensure that they feel that they're getting the transparency from the food companies that they're investing in to ensure that we are getting the clarity of what food is being sold 
um, by whom, and the openness of those key metrics. So Will, absolutely thrilled to um, give you the stage. Thanks, Laura. Um, nice nice to, to see you here. Nice to see so many people joining the webinar. Um, so yeah, as, as Laura says, has said, the, uh, the metrics that we use um, for the business reporting on food sales comes from our, our broader plating up progress work. Um, and specifically in this case, we've been looking at food sales. The, uh, the, the premise for that really is that if we are going to see a shift in, um, in our, our eating habits and our patterns for our diets towards healthy and sustainable food, then we're going to see that in terms of sales data for the major players in the food industry. Um, so it's a bit of a litmus test for what's happening in that sense. It also, if, if that data is made publicly available and is transparent, then it allows um, other stakeholders such as the government and as, as, Laura, um, as Laura said, investors to act on that data. Um, so so it's, it's an important part of the jigsaw puzzle. What the, what the what our data this year shows is that of the 11 food, major food retailers that we look at, only one of them is reporting on uh, sales of healthy food, sales of vegetables and animal versus plant-based proteins. And in the out-of-home sector, none are reporting on all three, although four of them are reporting on um, the percentage of sales that come from vegetables. Uh, so it's a small number that are reporting on all of these, it's worth pointing out that we focus here on reporting, not targets. Uh, we, we do look at targets in, in the, the wider plating of progress work, but specifically this metric in, plating in, in, in broken plate is looking at um, reporting of sales. So in the, 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 the six and the 12, the big bars that are reporting on none of these three metrics, what's actually happening there is that there are businesses reporting on various bits of data, but none of it's consistent. Some of it is, is completely non-existent, but there'll be things like uh, reporting on the number of new products that are uh, plant-based and things like how much veg we've increased in our uh, ready meals, uh, percentage of menus that are, are vegetarian, things like this that are all great up to a point, but they don't really tell you what's going on. So the crucial point is it needs to be sales based for it to actually mean anything. Um, as most of you will know, and as Anna uh, said at the start, the, the government's food strategy response uh, came out last month. And one of the glimmers of hope on that was a commitment to look at reporting across the food industry and the creation of the Food Data Transparency Partnership. So we see that as being one of the big place areas that we can really collectively push on to make sure that the right metrics are in there and that it's made mandatory for businesses over a certain size to report on sales of, of healthy and sustainable food. We'd make a strong argument that, that the three metrics we include here are, are part of that um, and that, that it actually does become mandatory. And then we can get onto the important business of looking at the targets, because it's the targets that are gonna create the change. Um, I'll just finish off really quickly by saying, you don't need me to point out what a hot day it is. And we've already talked about the um, cost of living crisis and food price instability. Um, if we don't act, there, things like this will become the new normal. Um, and we need to see a shift in our diets, healthy and sustainable, and that needs to come with a shift in what the food industry is selling. So this is the starting point for that shift. Thanks, Laura. Thanks so much, Will, and all that you do on this. And I mean, it is for boardrooms now to be understanding exactly what the companies that, that they are uh, the governance body for actually are selling, and we will be pushing this very hard. Now, finally, I'd like to introduce Alfie Slade from the Obesity Health Alliance. Alfie is kindly joining us today to give us his thoughts about um, what, how much money is being spent in advertising. And we have, con we have used this metric um, many times, but it comes back in some ways. It relates to what Will was talking about. What are the decisions that businesses are making when they start to, um, when they look at their expenditure? Uh, when they prioritise uh, their business success. And so, Alfie, I know you're going to cover a lot on the balance between what one might, what one would say is discretionary foods and core foods, but very importantly, um, really healthy foods. So, Alfie, thank you very much indeed. 
Thank you. The most important thing to remember uh, is that marketing drives a vast amount of consumption of less healthy food and drink products. Companies spend millions every year to keep these products in the spotlight, and they would not do this if this did not work. Marketing influences what children eat, how much they eat, and what food they prefer. As we see from this report, the use of these techniques is skewed massively. 32% on discretionary foods, less healthier foods, and just 1% on fruits and vegetables. It's also worth noting that the 36% that is on brand advertising, much of that will be for brands that are functionally interchangeable with the less healthy foods that those brands sell. The proportion of TV advertising for less healthy products is actually even higher, particularly during family uh, peak family viewing hours of 6 to 9 p.m. And of course, children in, uh, and adults in more deprived groups are 50% more likely to be exposed to adverts for products that are high in fat, salt and or sugar. So there is a profound implication for health inequalities here. And remember, we are not just talking about advertising on TV and, and online. The so-called marketing mix relies on four different things, the product, the price, the placement and the promotion. We're all familiar with uh, a lot of the different tactics that are used to facilitate that. Um, things like pushing chocolate bars at supermarket checkouts, uh, placing sweets at eye levels with toddlers and relying on so-called tester power, uh, the use of cartoon characters, superheroes and other images that appeal to children on packaging, uh, the use of misleading claims like one of your child's five a day or source of vitamins. Um, these claims, while true, often give a misleading impression that a product is healthier than it actually is. Uh, recent evidence is that 41% of products aimed at children that include some kind of uh, that kind of claim are actually for HFSS products. Uh, these are just a few examples of marketing tactics that shape people's purchasing decisions. Uh, it's also very important that we don't treat this issue as being separate from the cost of living crisis. Advertising is designed to encourage people to buy more and when it comes to food this often leads to people spending more than they intended to on products they weren't intending to buy. For example, uh, people think that promotional multi-buy deals save them money when the evidence shows that they actually increase the amount that people spend by over 20% and sustain that increased volume of purchase longer, uh, even after the promotional deals are no longer there. This is why the uh, Obesity Health Alliance, which is a coalition of 50 health charities, rural colleges and campaign groups, places such a high priority on tackling HFS advertising. We're not uh, advocating for the end of all food advertising, but using regulation to shift the focus onto healthier products will have a positive effect on people's choices. Ultimately, to fix our broken food system, we need to make the healthy choice the easy choice, and changing the focus of advertising plays a key role in that. The government recognised the importance of this issue, which is why they passed world-leading restrictions on TV and, on, uh, and online advertising earlier this year. Um, this would have created a much bigger space for healthier adverts to take those spots. Unfortunately, as many of you will already be aware, they have recently announced that there is an intention to delay the implementation of these crucial policies by at least a year. Um, and the, uh, this will be a devastating decision for children's health and something that the government should reconsider as a matter of urgency. I wanted to end by mentioning something that I heard from a young person from the youth charity Bite Back 2030, who was campaigning for greater restrictions on HFSS marketing. She took out her phone and showed us the texts that she was getting from a major fast food pizza chain. Uh, she'd given them, uh, them their, her number once for an order, uh, and then was immediately began getting uh, regular texts with promotional discount codes. They, these texts always appeared on school days, always at around 4 p.m. In her own words, this was precisely when she was at her most exhausted, hungry, and most likely to be with her friends and without a parent or a teacher around. We often hear about the importance of free choice and not allowing the nanny state to get in the way of our choices. And I always think of her whenever that argument gets raised, because how can anyone make a free choice when tactics like that are allowed to continue? Thank you. Thank you, Alfie. And it's a really, really important point, this issue about um, we, we did a report quite a while ago called Force Fed, and that is the whole, the, the food environment, the marketing, the, um, the whole pressure 
um, one day I would hope that um, children start pestering pe their parents for more apples and more broccoli. But I think we're quite a long way from that just at this moment. I just want to say thank you to all of you. You're all partners. We all work together. The Broken Plate is there as in many ways a testament to all the work that you do during the year. And hopefully um, as we go forward, we can provide even more texture on these metrics and, and effective measurement of the progress uh, that we need. But we'd like to finish with actually something really important that the Food Foundation has um, built up a group of food um, ambassadors. And um, Anna is going to interview Dominic Waters, who has been really at the forefront of this and has been very much involved in the blogging that we've done, has been very much a voice of what life is like with you know, kids, with economic pressure, with inflation and what it actually means to families. And I think that we would all do very, very well by really understanding the actual decisions that people have to make um, on lower incomes and who are facing lots of other uh, sort of pressures, both social and, and work pressures. Dominic, really, really wonderful to have you here. And I hand over to Anna to, to interview you. Thank you, uh, Laura, um, and wonderful to have you with us, Dominic. I'm hoping I'll be able to see you on my screen in a sec. Sorry, there we go, there you are. Um, nice to see you, and um, thank you so much. So this, everybody, this is Dominic Waters, who's been um, one of our lead bloggers uh, for Breadline Voices and is leading an incredible campaign around trying to get food insecurity um, greater attention really within the whole profession of social work, um, which is, is really, really um, amazing. Um, uh, so Dominic, you've written in your blogs um, quite a lot about what it's like to live in a food desert. You talk about living in a food desert in the Garden of England, and you've talked about some of the impacts of the um, current inflation and the cost of living crisis on just everyday decisions. Um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about that um, and the experiences that, you know, you might see other families going through in your in your neighbourhood? Tell us a little, bring some of the issues in Broken Plate to life from a kind of real practical perspective. Yeah, thanks, Anna, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's amazing. Um, yeah, so I'm a single dad. I live in like the most deprived blocks of my council estate with my amazing daughter. And we survive off universal credit, um, child benefit, free school meal vouchers. And also, yeah, we've also like only got pay as you go gas and electric. Um, yeah, so as you kind of highlighted, like, the estate, it, it's a food desert, the only, like there's real um, lack of access to nutrition and also to fuel. So like just to top up, um, you know, your gas and electric, so you can kind of like boil your kettle or cook um, food is an issue, which also I think speaks to a couple of the metrics um, reflecting on it, because I actually, I, lo I love cooking for my daughter. Um, and, you know, if, you know, we have to use Canterbury Food Bank quite a lot, but, um, you know, that helps us with uh, sometimes rice, pasta and tins and stuff, and then we can get fish, but cooking or chicken, but cooking from scratch costs a lot more, um, like cooking chicken for 45 minutes in the, or frying for a bit than in the oven, like that, you, you're mindful that that um, costs a lot more on your gas and electric than, um, you know, sticking something in the microwave that is just a ready meal. And yeah, and just in terms of like social work. So when I started, there was the, uh, studying social work, there was no work being done in terms of food insecurity and social work. And kind of ever since then, I've had like a focus on bringing that inequality of food insecurity directly into the domain of social work, because ultimately you, you, a hungry child is a child in need. And so, I think that there's 
I, I think it's because of a level of snobbery that is shared in many professional environments, but there's been a real lack of focus on um, children living in poverty. Thanks, Dominic. And um, you talked quite a lot about um, cooking for your daughter. You've also talked about the the free school meal vouchers. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, because that's such a, to a, a topical thing at the moment as we sort of start to think about the summer holidays. And I think you're concerned about how they're gonna, whether those vouchers are going to actually enable you to get the food that you need to eat well during the holidays yeah definitely so yeah like i tried to i've started like a campaign that's having a a bit of impact called food is care and it's amazing now to be you know recognized by you know leaders in the profession and the food foundation which you know having me like a voice of council estate poverty here with the launch of the report kind of speaks to that co-production and um, between you know people with living experience of the inequality and absolute leaders in the profession but in terms of um, the free school meals it's like what you could get for three pounds um, so a free school meal voucher that I get for my daughter is it equates to three pounds a day um, but that's not including weekends so I think it's like during the summer holidays it's like two pounds 14 a day 14p a day but what you could get prior to like the cost of living crisis and prior to COVID, the amount of food you could get for three pounds is um, a lot more than what you can get now. Mm. And so like coupled with the, you know, the overpriced um, pay as you go gas and electric, coupled with the lack of access to nutrition with the only shop on the estate stock in, you know, lowest quality of produce, and then like, you know, seeing how like other families may be going on holidays and doing these sort of things, when you're just struggling to even consider literally the bare necessities on top of that, having universal credit, um, saying that they've overpaid you and, and not, not paying your rent or not contributing towards your rent arrears, which leads to letters seeking like possession of your properties, so you're facing homelessness, like, it's, it's a whole lot to juggle and it really like it shows how food is way more than just what we eat mm. the whole system it puts in place like lack of access to actual social mobility and yeah I don't know it's 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 a lot yeah and I think that's why you've you've really I mean I think in telling that that whole sort of all the knock-on implications or the ways in which life is so connected and complicated to keep everything kind of moving in the right direction. Um, you've, you've challenged us around sort of the definitions around food, food security, haven't you done? I mean, your, your sort of leadership on this agenda has just been amazing. And we've just, it's been such a pleasure to, to work with you on it. But I think you've challenged us to sort of not talk about lived experience, but to talk about living experience, to think about food security in terms of not just the economic impact of food insecurity but what it means for your social relationships and communities in, in in you know the 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 people that your relationships with loved ones and so forth and it's been um uh, thank you for being so sort of open with your ideas and your experiences because i know that they just um really help to um uh explain to people the sort of reality um and particularly the reality now when the cost of living crisis is just having such devastating effects. Um, thank you for joining us, Dominic. I'm going to, unless you, there's any, if you wanted to have a final word on anything, you're very welcome. Go for it. <laughs> well, thank you, Anna. I would just say that, like, yeah, thank you so much for like, and it shows, anyway, just it's amazing that my work has a bit of an impact. But yeah, so like after locating gaps in like law, policy, and practice guidance in particular in kind of social care and social work. Um, I've designed like a poverty and food insecurity module that is like the first of its kind and it's unique that it's from a voice of living experience of these inequalities. And um, yeah, if it's okay to just quickly promote, um, hopefully it will 
drag me out of the um, impoverished um, situation where I speak to you from now, even though I've got a new kitchen after 15 years um, <laughs> to Twitter and stuff. Um, but yeah, so, and my work's been endorsed by the Amazing Food Foundation and David Brindle. But I've, what I've done is I've created a food inequality framework that kind of mirrors the idea of micro, meso and macro. And it goes from food poverty, food insecurity to food inequality. And I'm just, I'd love to be able to share that with more people and my work in the future. So just thank you so much for this opportunity. Thanks, Dominic. Just remind us what your, so your Twitter handle is called so people might well want to follow you. Oh, wow. Well, it's called uh, I'm Single Dad SW. So at Single Dad SW. Yeah, do follow Dominic. He's got loads of fantastic ideas and his campaign's really gaining momentum. So over to you now, Laura. Thank you, Dominic, very much. Thank you, Dominic. And maybe we can put your Twitter handle in the chat. Um, Dominic, you actually um, keep us true to our mission. And I really wanted to thank you for being such an important part of the Food Foundation and being, oh, wow. you should look at the chat. Please do look at the chat. You okay. know exactly what people are saying. And so a huge thank you. Um, I wanted to finish by saying thank you to everybody on this, on, on this call. Um, everybody who's participated in the Broken Plate and all the ideas that have come through from the widest group of people that we work with, that we partner with. I wanted to again say a big thank you to the Nuffield Foundation for their support. Um, I don't think that anybody who's been on this call can sort of go away without thinking we really need change and we need some action. And public health has always been in many ways the Cinderella of both the health system but also of policy making. But food is at the heart of public health and our children's future trajectory. Um, so when we look at the situation today, we've had COVID, we've got massive inflation, which is to be frank and very sadly going nowhere. And as Dominic said, this is, this is inflation right across the board, right across the whole of people's lives from energy to food and to other pro products and services. But even before COVID and inflation, the, the situation was not good. So we really need all of us to work together to get the action that's needed, the eligib eligibility of free school meals, the extension of those over summer holidays. We need to look at benefits that need to be raised to meet these inflationary costs. A good food bill is a really crucial platform for that. And we need, as we've seen in many of the um, presentations today, a serious tipping of the balance between good food and bad food, whether that be on the cost base or whether it be the advertising or the accessibility. So I hope that as we go forward, we will all work together to ensure again that we are making the case that we're not going to allow the food system not to be a front of mind of politicians, but be absolutely central to our nation's health, our nation's well-being, and the future of our children. I want to say a huge thank you to the Food Foundation and the great team there, and to everybody who's worked so hard to get this report out. Thank you very much, and great to be here another year. See you in 2023.